Good morning, friends. Let me ask you a question as we begin this morning. In fact, let me ask you a nightmarish question as we begin this morning. What would you say is the worst example of forgetfulness that you've ever personally experienced? I mean, the worst ever, the worst example, the worst experience of your own personal forgetfulness ever, all time. Maybe it was a birthday, an anniversary, maybe an important personal appointment, or worse, maybe a, a personal promise. When's the worst example that you can think of, of your own personal forgetfulness? Now, let me ask you this. What was the cost of your forgetfulness? What was the long-term ultimate consequence or consequences of your forgetfulness? Let me tell you why I ask. We're going to spend our time together this morning in Hebrews chapter 10. And Hebrews chapter 10 is an eternal exhortation not to forget. That God and his word would warn those that would read the book of Hebrews, and especially chapter 10, to never again forget that which distinguishes the difference between the futile and the faithful in God's church. That God would say, don't you ever forget that which distinguishes the difference between the futile and the faithful in church. Now, I'd like to open this morning by sharing with you exactly what it is that is not to be forgotten. I want you to watch this and, and take to heart as we go into Hebrews chapter 10 that what you're about to hear is an encapsulation of the truth that you and I dare not ever forget. Watch this and then we'll pick right back up. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God, the Word was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made, and without Him nothing was made that has been made, and Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness did not recognize it. The light shines through the darkness, but the darkness didn't even notice. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Even in his own land and among his own people, he wasn't wanted. But to those who believed him, to those who believed in his name, to those who believed he was how he claimed and would do what he said, he gave the right to become children of God. And we have seen his glory, the glory that a one and only son can only receive from his father, full of grace and truth. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. The Word became human and lived here on earth among us. And having become human, He stayed human. He humbled Himself. He didn't accept any special privileges. He lived a selfless, obedient life to die a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death at that crucifixion. But it was our sins that did that to Him. He was bruised and wounded for everything that we've done wrong. He was wounded for our transgressions, pierced for our iniquities. He did all this just so we could be whole. And God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every tongue confessed that Jesus is the master of all. This is the resurrection, that the Son came and gave his life, that he extended an invitation to know the God of all creation, that he offered us love when we knew no peace, that he offered us relationship when all we knew how to do was keep and break a bunch of rules. This is the resurrection, that in his death we have come to know life, that we can freely offer our life to him. Amen. That's the gospel of Jesus the Christ. You got a little New Testament, a little Old Testament, but the bottom line is this. Those two and a half minutes just laid out for you and me what is at the very core of Christianity. The gospel 
of Jesus the Christ. Another way of looking at it is it's an explanation of the new covenant that all biblical believers live out in and through Christ. That's at the heart of what it means to be a Christian. Now, having said that, let me just share with you what is the timeless truth for today. It's that we need to remember, you and me, Christian, you and me, churchgoer, we need to remember that any and all religious rituals are foolish and futile without the work of Christ and the worship of of Christ, without the saving work of Christ and the sanctifying worship of Christ, everything else is futile. That's the point of Hebrews chapter 10. My prayer is as you and I walk through, we'll see in verses 1 through 11, the futile. In verses 12 through 18, we'll see what is the often forgotten. And in verses 19 through 25, we'll see a beautiful portrait of the family of God, the faithful. And here's the the kind of the takeaway as we go through this. You're going to see that the futile are futile because they forgot who and what Christ is and what he has done. It's what separates the futile from the faithful. It's what is typically forgotten. And so that's what we'll have, a three-point walkthrough, the first 25 verses of chapter 10 in Hebrews, a message that I have entitled, The Futile and the Faithful. And you'll see that what separates them is what is often forgotten, the truth and the love about Jesus the Christ. So having said that, let's jump right in. If you have your Bibles, and I pray that you do, I want you to come with me and let's begin now by looking at the futile in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 11. Now you're going to note here in the first four verses that any and all shadows are futile. Any and all substitutes for Christ are futile. Any and all sinners who deny Christ are futile. And any and all sacrifices that are not Christ are futile. Listen from God's word. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never. Here's what's futile. The shadows are futile without the substance that is Christ. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect. It can never make perfect. It's futile. All of these sacrifices, all of these substitutes, they're all shadows. They're futile because they're not the substance that is Christ. Verse 2, otherwise, would they have not ceased to be offered since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin? But, because that's not really the case, but in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. Every year, you see, for sinners, it's futile. They understand. Every year, I'm reminded, I'm a sinner because I sin. I sin because I'm a sinner. These sins cannot be brought anywhere that takes them away unless I surrender to victory in Jesus the Christ. That's the point. Verse 4, for it is impossible, it is impossible, it's futile, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. You see, that's the point. Anything and everything but Christ is futile. It doesn't matter how religious you are. It doesn't matter how often you repeat these rituals. If it's not Christ, it's incomplete. Listen, we see this opening up now in verses 5 through 11. In verse 5, we see it's only the Savior who can save us. Verse 5, Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. See, this is God in his word making it clear that it's only the Savior who can save. This was the plan from the very beginning. 
As we go on, you'll see that it's only as written in Scripture that you and I can trust. Anything else is futile. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. See, this is God's word explaining God's word. It's only as laid out in the scriptures that you and I can put our faith. Anything else, any other description, any other way, it's futile. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. How do we know it's God's will? Because it was in God's word. It was written in the word. See, it's all interconnected. God's word, God's will, God's ways. All of this, it's laid out for us in the scriptures. And we see that it's in the scriptures that we learn it's only the suffering servant that can bring on this true solution. Everything else is futile. He says he does, he does away with the first, the first covenant in order to establish the second. Who's he? The suffering servant that would bring about the reality of the new covenant. You see, herein we find the supreme solution to all of sin and our selfish problems, this solution, the supreme solution is found in the second covenant. And by that will, by the will of God that is laying out the sacrifice of Christ to enable and empower the new covenant, by that will, we have been sanctified, we've been set apart through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. What a glorious truth that is. You see, this is where and how we can become holy. He died for us so that we could become holy. If you question that, I want you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want you to see what was called for in Leviticus. Be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Was empowered and made available to true Christians through Christ in the new covenant as laid out in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Read verses 17 through 21 and you'll see that if and when this is true for you, Then the old is gone, the new has come. You're a new creation. In fact, it's down in verse 21 that we're told that he, the father, made him, the son, sin, who knew no sin, so that you and I might become the righteousness of God in Christ. We can be holy because of the truth that is being explained here. Don't forget it. See, that's the point. Everything else but Christ is futile. We need to put our faith, our full faith in him and him alone. In the last verse, verse 11, you see that where and when we serve or sacrifice superficially, anything but the Savior is only going to waste time and energy and perhaps even worse, give us a false confidence Listen, it's verse 11, and and again, the author of Hebrews is reminding the people, don't be satisfied, don't settle for religion. You've got to come home to the Redeemer and live this out. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11, and every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. See, it's again, emphasizing, it's what Benjamin Franklin said, uh, marks the definition of insanity, to keep doing the same thing and expecting different results. Well, that's not Ben Franklin's definition. That's God's definition of insanity. That's what we're being told here in Hebrews 10, 1 through 11, that if you keep doing this same thing, and and note, it says that they keep standing. That's God's way of saying they're not done. You see, Jesus, by contrast, he sits at the right hand of the Father, meaning that he's done. He's completed that part of his work. There was no chair in the Holy of Holies because the work there would never be complete. It's never done. It's futile. It's superficial. It's a sacrifice that's never going to suffice. That's the point. And it points us to the Savior. Now, unfortunately, that's often forgotten. And that's what we see in our second point in verses 12 through 18. If you don't want to be in the futile, then you must never forget 
what it is that defines and brings us into the faithful. Let's look at verses 12 through 18 and see what is sadly too often forgotten. Verse 12, but when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. See, this verse, it's so full, but it's sadly often forgotten. What? We see here that it's forever. What Christ did is forever. It's for, quote, for all time. We see that it's final. It's a single sacrifice for sin. It's one and done. He's completed it. In fact, he told us, and it's expressed by the fact that he sat down at the right hand of the Father, it is finished. You see, verse 12 tells us what people forget is that this is a forever sacrifice. It's a final sacrifice. It is finished. All that is needed is done through the sacrifice that is Christ. Verse 13, waiting from that time until his enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. Here's another thing that's sadly forgotten, is that if you choose the path of the fools or the foes, you will end up a footstool for Christ. You will know the wrath of God. You'll see this next week when this exhortation turns towards the warning. Oh, friend, I pray to God that you'll understand and don't forget that if you push away this truth, you will become a footstool. You will come under the very weight of the wrath of God. Verse 14, one of the most beautiful verses in all the Bible. For by a single offering, he has perfected, that's past tense, for by a single offering, he, Jesus, has perfected, past tense, for all time, future tense, those who are being sanctified. That's an active present tense. Now note this, this is the fullness of what Christ has accomplished. Past tense, present tense, future tense. And it also shows that while all of this is of grace, it brings with it a responsibility, an expectation that you and I are going to be works in progress all the way home. That what he accomplished, he did in the past, it covers the presence and it will walk us through the future. This is the good news. Let us not forget it. Let us not forget what was done, what is happening, and what will be covered as we go forward. Well, friends, I want you to listen to one of my favorite songs from when we went through the book of Leviticus. And I just want you to think about this, that regardless of where you were, where you are, or where you think you will be, that the invitation of the gospel, don't forget this, it's to come as you are and to come to the altar that is Christ and to surrender to victory in him and him alone to realize that nothing else will cut it. Oh, don't, don't ever forget what it takes to be in the family of the faithful. Watch this and I, play, I pray that you'll be encouraged and reminded. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to Have you come to the end of yourself? 
Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Joy from the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior! Isn't He wonderful? Sing Alleluia! Christ is risen. Before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing Alleluia, Christ is risen. Bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Amen, friends. Our past, our present, and our future are all covered in the covenant that Christ has initiated with his sacrifice. Oh, may we never forget again, that we not be listed amongst the futile, but that we be recognized in the faithful family of God. Let's look now in verses 15 through 18 and, and see as this is building to a crescendo. Again, God's word. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, and my words here, and through us, that's Acts 1.8. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after these days, declares the Lord, that I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. See, friends, this is a description of the faithful family, the forgiven family of God. Oh, I pray that you understand that this is an incredible gift. Don't you ever forget that if you are in the forgiven, faithful family of God, that that's forever. Again, that's forever. All you need to do is look to God's word when he says that when you have been forgiven, that he will remember your sins no more, that your sins have been removed as far as the east is from the west, that you've been gifted with the righteousness of God, that you've truly been given eternal life. Oh, the promise that this is. And again, see, this is what you and I can't forget. You just can't forget this. Otherwise, you will drift into, you'll disconnect back into, you'll ultimately disobey and become the futile. But if this is truly what has happened, if you've been captured by grace and you are in this faithful family of God, then don't you ever forget. Don't, don't you dare stumble down into that which will pull you away from the very promises and power and purposes of Almighty God. Oh, friend, I, I want to ask you, if you would, to, to make a commitment not to forget these truths of the new covenant. In fact, I'd like us to take communion together. You see, it was Jesus who said, don't you ever forget this. He said, I want you to remember what I did in the new covenant. I want you to remember these times and these places. 
And so as the elements are going to be distributed, I again want to share with you a song that I pray will be like a spiritual sorbet. That in these next few minutes, listen to the words of this song that says, all my hope is in Jesus. That it's being washed by the blood of the lamb that sets us free. Oh, again, please hold the elements as they're passed. And, and know this, that, that when we take communion here at the bridge, this is for biblical believers. So if you're not yet a Christian, please hold off. This is not for you. This is for those who want to remember what Christ has done for us, who acknowledge that we are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Oh, believer, Bring your heart to the Lord now and don't take these elements in a few minutes. If you've not repented and come clean with the Lord, ask him to purge you of any sin that you may have as we come thanking him, remembering and not forgetting that we don't have to live amongst the futile. We get to be the faithful. Watch this, hold the elements and we'll come right back and we will remember the blood that has washed us clean. We'll remember how it is that we get to be the family of God. Amen, friends. I, I pray 
that you take now the cracker that represents the broken body of Christ. What you and I need to remember is that there's no way for us to celebrate what it is to be in the faithful, forgiven family of God if it is not for the one and only Jesus the Christ, crucified and risen. Now remember, he told us to do this in remembrance of him. I I want you to realize, like I did last week, when I, I reminded you of the cross, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. No, there's nowhere in the scripture that says, remember the day I was born. It doesn't even say, remember the day that I rose again, but he gave specific commands that we do this in remembrance of him, that we remember what happened on the cross, that he loved us this much, that it cost him this much. Oh, may we never forget the broken body of our king. If you would take his body now symbolically and remember his amazing grace. In the same way, I ask you now to take the juice, which represents the blood of Christ. Take that which represents the blood of the Lamb. That in which we get our confidence in the blood of our King. And again, symbolically, giving Him praise and thanks choosing to remember what it cost him to set you free. I ask you now, together as a faith family, take the cup and drink, remembering our King. You know, I'm reminded of how chapter 9 ended in Hebrews. We're walking through chapter 10, but let me remind you again, as we choose here not to forget, not to drift into the futile, but to live as the faithful, it was Hebrews 9 verse 28 that said, So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. Praise God, he will appear a second time. Not to deal with sin again, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Oh, I pray that as we take communion, it reminds you that we are to live eagerly waiting for him. And I ask you, what does that look like? What what do you think it means to live a life that is eagerly waiting for Christ? Well, I'm here to tell you that if you'll look at the next paragraph, verses 19 through 25, you'll see one of the most pregnant, powerful, and most beautiful passages in all the Bible because it will answer that question. Do you want to know what it looks like to live eagerly waiting for Christ? Well, then come with me through this last chapter or this last paragraph of our time together this morning. And I want you to see just how pregnant verse 19 through 25 is. You're going to see in these few verses that it begins with a therefore statement, which ties together all of this paragraph with Hebrews 8, 1 and following. There'll be one therefore. There'll be two clauses that begin with the word since. It will explain how and why. Then you're going to see three encouraging exhortations where the scripture says, let us, let us, let us. Then you'll see seven different imperatives, commands that follow up the let us encouragement. Now, this is really key because in verses in chapter eight, verse one, all the way through chapter 10, verse 18, do you know that there are no imperatives, not a single command? All of that, 8, 1 through 10, 18, was designed to give us a portrait of the new covenant. And now here in verse 19 through 25, we have the imperatives unloaded. Here comes the so what. You want to know what they are? We're told here to draw near 
We're told to hold fast, to consider now, to stir up one another, to actively love and do good deeds, to not neglect coming together, to intentionally encourage one another. That's what we see here. Then there are literally over 20 prepositions that help to explain and expand those imperatives. It's an incredible passage. This paragraph alone, we could do a series for months and unpack this. So with that said, I want to invite you to revisit this paragraph later to see the portrait of the family of God. But for our time together now, I just ask you, if you would, take a look at this portrait of the faithful the true church of Jesus Christ. Verse 19 says, Therefore, brothers, and note here he's talking generically to the Hebrew brothers. He hasn't said the holy brothers because he's not sure if they're just Hebrew or if they're holy, if they're hypocrites or if they're holy. So he says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence, now note this, I said it to you earlier, but pay close attention. Since we have confidence to enter the holy places, by the blood of Jesus. You see, you and I have confidence to come before the king, to go to the heavenly places, to pray with confidence to Christ our king because of the blood of Christ. Your confidence is in the blood of Christ. Note this, friends. You see, it it gives focus to the new covenant. It gives focus to Christianity. It gives focus to the church. You see, when you pull the cross out of the church, you've pulled Christ and Christianity out of the church. Our confidence to come before the king is based on the blood of Jesus. That's God's word. Verse 20, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. You see, the curtain was ripped from top to bottom to open up symbolically the heavenlies. Well, this is again another demonstration, an illustration that it's through the ripped and torn body of Christ that we get our confidence. It's his true torturous time on the cross and beyond when he drank the cup of the wrath of God. That's what opens up for us the confidence to come before our king. Verse 21, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, now watch in verse 22 as what follows now, here come the exhortations and here come the imperative commands. Since then, number one, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and with our bodies washed with pure water. See, friends, we are to come with confidence because of the blood of Christ with a true heart sprinkled clean. I think of this illustration. I've created what I call the stick man gospel. And in there, it explains the gospel. And it shows that there are people who try to jump over the cross Those are the spiritual goats. We show then in the illustration a people who try to tunnel under the cross. And we say they're the spiritual wolves. It's only those that come to and through the cross of Christ that are washed by the blood of the lamb that represent the lambs. The the sheep, if you will. The sheep dogs and the under shepherds. That's what we see in this verse. Make sure that you come with a clean, true heart sprinkled with the blood of Christ. Let us draw near with that true heart. Verse 23 then says, let us hold fast. Let us hold on the confession of our hope without wavering. I love that. Here's my transliteration of that. Hold on no matter what. Hold on no matter what. That's the word of God. Why? Because he who promised is faithful. You see, friends, you and I can only be faithful because he has been faithful. And yet, because he is faithful, you and I have been commanded to hold on no matter what. Oh, I pray to God that that's who you want to be. To understand that anything less puts you in the pile of the futile. No, we want to be in the faithful family of God. Verse 24, and here again, I see one of the most beautiful and pregnant passages in all of Scripture. 
And let us consider how. Let us consider how. Again, it's a command. Consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. You see, friends, you've been commanded by Christ, by our King, to help one another, to embrace all that he has, to to live out an active expression of his love and good deeds, to stir up one another. I want to ask you, when was the last time you helped to stir somebody else up? When was the last time you thanked somebody for helping to stir you up? Oh, friend, I pray to God that this is your heart's desire, that you want to be a relentless Christian, to to fulfill the call to be a relentless church family, to be the faithful. Oh, I pray that this piece from Eric Ludy will help to just just wake you up, to to stir you up, to, to fire up your want to, to walk and work and worship as a witness that brings glory to God. Watch this, and then we'll come back and we'll close. Praise God. We need to be a praying and confessing church, not one or the other, and not just esteeming prayer and not doing it, not just esteeming the confession and using this mouth to speak forth in this world, in this generation, the truths of Jesus Christ, but to actually do it. We are responsible as the saints of God to allow this tongue to be overtaken by the Holy Spirit and to let him speak. There is a truth that will not be heard in this generation unless we speak it. We live in a culture in which Christianity is being continually pressed into silence. And if you speak, that's when you get into trouble. You know, I don't want to hear about all your views about Jesus being the only way, Jesus being God. Oh, I'm a sinner. I need to repent. Yeah, yeah, that's for yesteryear. We've moved past that, have we? There is still only one means of salvation. And that means is Jesus Christ. If you don't say it, they don't hear it. You see, most of us maybe are willing to be laughed at. Well, that's hard. But to lose our life, I don't know, let us think a little longer. We need to get past the thinking and get to the decision that this will cost us our life. We need to recognize that it has always cost true Christianity its life to stand up and pursue the souls of those around it. We are not here to passively make our way through our life, somehow just make it to the other end and graduate into heaven. We have a job to do and it's not to just somehow get a good career and get a good job and raise kids to go off and do the same. It's to lay down our life that this world would see Jesus Christ. Mark 16, 15, written to Eric Ludi. And he said unto Eric Ludi, go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This is still a commission that must weigh upon my soul in every situation. Go you therefore, Eric Ludi, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Ghost. And the Lord said unto Eric Ludi, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. As my Father has sent me, even so I send you, Eric Ludi. What if, what if your name got stuck in that? Even so I send you. The same way Jesus was sent. How was he sent? He went and he sought out the cause that he knew not. He went to seek and save that which was lost. Seek and save it. So the way that he was sent, so you are sent. What are we in stride with? You see, we are to be confessors, which means when the word of God moves this way, what do we do? We move. When the word of God speaks this, what do we do? We speak. You see, we are confessing as the church of Jesus Christ. We are in stride with the Spirit, with the Word of God. Whatever He does, we do. Whatever He speaks, we speak unashamedly. Will it lead to our persecution? Guaranteed. The return of the Christian Christian. Those who won't take no as a valid answer. For what? For sharing the gospel. Where's your soul at? Do you want Jesus? No. I don't accept that. Do you accept a no for an answer? What if the world says, we don't want Jesus? What do we do? Eh, they don't want him. Or do we say, unless you have him, you don't have life. 
I must pursue you. Relentless Christianity, pursuing the lost with the pursuit of the Holy Spirit. How does the Holy Spirit pursue you? The Holy Spirit is relentless. He pursues with relentless love, with relentless kindness, with relentless truth, and with relentless invitation. Is that the way we function as Christians in this world? You were relentlessly pursued. Now you must allow the relentless Savior to love and pursue others through you. The mission of relentless love. If they slam the door in your face, then go to the window. If the window shuts, then go to the dog door. If the dog door is boarded up, then go to the chimney. If the chimney shoots out ash, then start rapping on the siding with Morse code. If you get shot in the chest with a bullet and your life is fading away, then whisper your love to the sinner and call on one of us to pick up where you left off. What is this? How does the sinner respond to this? It melts them. The power of love is overwhelming. But are we willing to wield it as our chief weapon? Are we ready? to be the church of Jesus Christ. Yes, Lord, you can have this body, you can have this tongue, and you can send me even as you were sent. If left to my own strength and my own boldness, which is nothing, I will not succeed. So I don't lean on that. I go to your boldness. I ask for it. I ask for your courage. But not just that, the love with which to apply that boldness. See, I don't just want to be bold, yell in people's faces. I want to love them so much that I give them the gospel the very way that they most need it. Do you love and do you care the way God does? But can we have this same love? The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. It's actually a statement of fact in the Word of God that this love, which is known as the love of God, is shed abroad. The Holy Spirit has been dumped like a Niagara waterfall. Could you imagine a little cup under Niagara Falls? Yes. Now you have a little more than you need there. We're the cup. We have more than we need. So what happens to all the excess? It gets on everyone around us. You see, we are literally the vehicles through which God pours out and pours through. Reasoning like heaven. How does heaven reason on this point? Christ bled, suffered, and died for that lost soul, currently crouched defiantly behind the tree-like legs of the giant of sin. And he assigned me to go after that soul. Isn't that an amazing thought to think? Because we always are like, oh, I hope someone reaches them. I hope they hear the gospel someday. But to recognize we're the ones that have received the assignment. He picked us. He chose us for this assignment. Go into all the world and rescue my sheep. I have not given you the spirit of timidity, but the spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Go! Go, Eric! Go, Church of Jesus Christ! Do not fear this giant! Go! Do not heed his disdain or his mockeries! Go! Go! Relentlessly pursue those entrapped in his snare. Amen, friends. I pray to God that you want to be that relentless Christian, that you embrace the privilege that it is to be that relentless church that is all about the great commission, the great commandment, living out the great combat that is spiritual warfare, that we may be a people that bring glory to God. Listen to verse 25, and this is where we'll close for today. It says, we're not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but rather we're encouraging one another. Again, this is the portrait of the faithful. We are encouraging one another and all the more as we see the day, the day of Christ's return drawing near. Friends, I want you to understand that biblical encouragement, it's not about you, it's about Christ. You see, there are far too many people who, who don't understand that to encourage means to bring courage to another, to help to inspire someone to go beyond their comfort and complacent lives, to, to embrace what Christ has called and created you to be. Now, sadly, there are too many people that don't really want to be encouraged. They just want to be coddled. What's well, my prayer that we as a church family, that we will forever be an encouraging, a biblically encouraging people.
Let us not drift into that coddling of complacency. No, we want to be a people who to the glory of God are committed to and focused on the type of relationships that are deeply rooted in an up component, an in component, and an out component, that we help to develop one another's head for truth, heart for love, and hands for work and warfare, that we'll help to encourage each other to be the church, ecclesia, the called out, set apart people of God that will help one another to live in koinonia, a supernatural unity that Christ prayed for in John 17, that will help one another not just to be the church, ecclesia, not just be supernaturally unified in koinonia, but that will do it all in the context of a togetherness that Acts 2 calls Hamath Umadon, that we will have a shared, unified, singular sense of passion and purpose, that which brings glory to God no matter what. Oh, and that we would do this with a local, a regional, and global Acts 1-8 commitment. You see, all of this, it, it's all tied together. This is what it is to be the faithful, to understand and to remember what we celebrate when we go back to the Lord's Supper, when we take the broken body of Christ and we take the spilled symbolic blood of Christ and we remember, we don't forget. We say we will be the faithful no matter what. Oh, friends, it will celebrate the up, the in, and the out. It will focus on the head, the heart, and the hands. It will say we want to be the church, the ecclesia, called out, set apart people of God in koinonia, a supernatural unity with homothumadon context where we have a single unified riotous passion for the single purpose of bringing glory to God. We'll do that locally, regionally, and globally as we've been called to do. And we'll do it all, all by God's grace, through God's gospel, and for God's glory. No more, no less, no matter what. Well, friends, I pray that as I close our time together today, and I share with you just one more living example of this being actually demonstrated, illustrated, and happening in our faith family, that you'll realize after I pray that what you're going to see is not a commercial on television, but you're going to see our church on mission. You're going to see Hebrews 10, 1 through 25 on display. Again, by his grace, through his gospel, and for his glory. Oh Lord, I pray that we as a people will never drift into the futile, that we'll never forget what you have done and the cost that it came at to make us the faithful family, the forgiven eternal family of God. May you continue to bless our efforts to bring your truth and your love to those locally, regionally, and globally within our reach. I thank you for this living thanksgiving and this demonstration of your mercy and grace in and through our family. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen. <music> My morning grew quiet, my feet rose.
cause to dance When death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free washes over I'm a prisoner no more My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore And he canceled my debt and he called me his friend Many years and many years. God wants to give you thanks. We want to 
place our food in the name of Jesus' son. Lord, you say in Matthew that wherever one or two or three gathered in my name, you will be within us. Lord, be here and lead us wherever in you have to open for us the way, to have a support, to have a hope from a different part of the world. Lord, you are the one who created the whole world. Lord, you children are crying every day. We pray that, Paul, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.